Let me talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of this technology. So blockchain actually adds a lot. It provides something that we didn't have before. So it allows us to verify ownership. So you can quickly check this immutable ledger to see if somebody actually owns what they claim to own. And again, this ledger is immutable. So it gives this verification of ownership. It also allows for the efficient exchange of ownership. Okay, so this is an exchange without a middle person. Or perhaps you could think of the algorithm as the middle person, but it's just allowing for a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transfer. And it's also interesting that this technology doesn't differentiate, doesn't put labels on people. So in traditional finance, you're a customer, a retailer, a banker. There's nothing like this in this technology. Okay, so um, this is a much different uh, situation than we've had in the past where you're a peer and there's no other label that's relevant. So these blockchains are, are special. Um, so again, blockchain is a general uh, technology. There's many different implementations of it. When I talk about a consensus uh, protocol, what I mean by that is essentially a set of rules that determine what kind of blocks uh, can become part of the chain and are eligible to be the truth. Okay, so there's different consensus mechanisms that we'll talk about uh, in, in the course. Importantly, once the block is in the chain, it's there forever. So if you make a mistake and send uh, some token to the wrong person, it's too bad. It's there. Maybe that person might decide to return it, but it's completely up to them. Um, and these protocols are all designed to be resistant to tampering with, um, up to a certain bound. Okay, so different protocols for consensus and we've really only focused on proof of work at this stage, uh, they all have their limitations, uh, including uh, proof of work. So um, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, use proof of work as their, as their consensus uh, uh, protocol. And what's happening is, as I said, the miners are going through these numbers, trying to find a very special hash that has got this property with a lot of leading uh, zeros. It is possible, however, in proof of work, that an attacker could theoretically come up with 51% of the network power and uh, cause some damage. Okay, so that's a limitation of uh, proof of work, even though I've already argued that it's just really unlikely that an attacker could afford uh, to do that. And uh, indeed, uh, it's not clear what the motive would be. Because if you do that attack and let's say uh, steal some token, given that people know that there's an attack, the confidence in the network basically plummets as would the value of the crypto. So the power of the network is a big benefit because it makes it just extremely unlikely that a successful attack uh, could be carried out. Now, as I said, there's many cryptocurrencies out there and many of them are nowhere near as strong in terms of proof of work as Bitcoin or Ethereum. And that is a risk for these smaller uh, cryptocurrencies because somebody could actually go 
perhaps even rent computing power to attack uh, that network. Okay, but for the main cryptos, they are very strong in terms of the uh, computing uh, power. So again, I introduced this idea of mining. So the miners are cycling through the nonces, try to find that uh, special uh, hash. Um, this is very intensive in terms of computation. And basically it's a lottery. And what I mean by that is that there are many different miners that are, are cycling through the hashes, trying to find that special hash. And the first one that discovers the, uh, the correct number of leading zeros wins. And what do they win? Well, they get some newly minted cryptocurrency. They also get the transaction fees that might be associated with the individual uh, transaction. So there's a big incentive to actually do this, but it is computationally uh, very burdensome uh, to actually do this. So remember, they are verifying transactions, then they basically do this work by putting a nonce attached to the, uh, the transactions, and then the one that wins the lottery gets paid, and it's a very generous uh, reward. That reward, interesting, about every three years is halved in Bitcoin, and, uh, and that's why in 2140, um, the supply of new Bitcoin um, goes to zero. So how difficult is it to find that winning hash? And this is an example I use in my class, a thought experiment. Suppose you've got 13 decks of cards and you've got a shuffling machine. And, and basically what you're going to do is to look for something really special. You turn over the first 13 cards of the shuffling of 13 decks and you are looking for the following. The two of clubs, the first 13 cards. So it's just incredibly rare. Just imagine how many times you would have to shuffle those 13 decks to be lucky enough to come up with 13 two of clubs and the first 13 cards. So this is the sort of computing power that's necessary. It's a huge amount of hashing or shuffling that's going on amongst the miners. So uh, we have uh, at Duke University a blockchain lab uh, for our students that has uh, some demonstration machines uh, that the miners actually uh, would use. And we actually have uh, a mining operation with an ant miner S17. And that's what it looks like on the right. And it does 53 trillion hashes per second. So it's a very powerful uh, machine. So again, the winner uh, gets a reward of a new Bitcoin. And if you were just mining on your own, it would be just infeasible. You have to wait centuries before you'd win even one. So our machine, even though it seems very powerful, 53 trillion hashes per second, it's actually only 0.002% of the network's power. Um, we also have uh, an Ethereum uh, mining machine. And again, it's a different uh, algorithm. Again, this machine, the S17, does one thing, the SHA-256. Uh, the Ethereum machine does one thing, the KCOC-256. Uh, and this is what um, our dashboard looks like in terms of the number of hashes we're doing per second. And then you can see the vertical lines are when um, the pool that we're in actually wins uh, the, the lottery. And what do I mean by pool? Remember I said that if we're operating alone, it would take centuries to win. So what people do is they pool. So you become part of a mining pool. And 
if the, let's say you've got 10% of the hashing power of the pool, when the pool wins, then you would get 10% of the winnings. And doing it this way, it means if you're in a larger pool, you're getting some sort of payout, uh, you know, perhaps multiple times uh, during the day. For Bitcoin, the, uh, the blocks are every 10 minutes. And this is an actual picture that I took uh, the other day of our mining rigs. Um, the one on the left is the S17 that does the SHA-256, and the E3 on the right does the KCOC-256. Uh, uh, so, in proof of work, um, you need to do mining. And it is both a strength and a weakness of the technology. So the strength is because of the unprecedented security. That is just, it really seems infeasible for any one or a group uh, to attack the Ethereum or Bitcoin uh, network. But it's also, as I mentioned earlier, a weakness because of the electricity cost of the mining is enormous. So Ethereum will migrate to a different, um, less energy inefficient technology for their consensus. So Ethereum will move from proof of work to a proof of stake mechanism. And that will likely happen in 2022. And that will solve the environmental problem for Ethereum. But Bitcoin is a different story. Uh, it's likely stuck in the proof of work um, mode. And I'll have more to talk about um, in terms of this risk to uh, Bitcoin in future modules.